Robert's a scratch for song. I get it. But I see you through Jesus' eyes. How's that? Does that work? Good morning to you. You know, I haven't preached in several weeks, right? No. <laughs> And some of you might be scared that when I get an opportunity, it's going to be a long unpacking, but amen. amen. <laughs> I'm grateful to gather with you today, and I'm just going to share a few words with you to set the stage and introduce a fellow that has taken his time in between trips around the world to come and uh, involve himself in the local body of Calvary Baptist Church to enhance, to edify us as a church body. And this is just a preemptive visit to soften us a little bit uh, before the coming in just a month. So I want to give you a portion of a verse to start the conversation and then open in prayer. James chapter 4, verse 8. Before I give it to you, let me ask you, does God keep his promises? Is there ever a time that God doesn't keep his promise? So James 4, chapter 8, the Holy Spirit says through James, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Does God keep his promise? No. So what he said is if you draw near to God, that what? Do you want to be nearer to God? <clears throat> That's the grand question. The promise is there. You know God keeps his promise. Do you want to be nearer to God? The scripture also goes on and says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. So the drawing is a leaving. The two go together. You cannot go to Fredericksburg without leaving Bowling Green. <clears throat> you cannot draw near to God without leaving some things behind. And that was an evidence in my life in 1996. I was in church. I was ordained as a deacon. I was involved in all of the ministries of the church. Uh, I, I assumed that was what Christianity was completely, that you go to church, you go to work. And I was working 15, 16 hour days, six days a week as a plant manager. And I took a study called Experiencing God. I would get up early before going to work at six in the morning. So I'd get up at 4.30 or five and do the work for the study. Uh, and I would go to the study group and unpack it. And I began to grow in my hunger for a deeper relationship with Christ. And there was a question in there in 1996, what do you need to do to continue growing this relationship with Christ? And I wrote, I need to give him more time. And after the study finished, I would continue to get up before going to work with my Bible, with a spiral notebook, and I would pursue concepts, words, I would unpack verse by verse. Those of you who've been in class with me know that I'm a verse by verse teacher because that's the way the Lord taught me. And I would chew on words and concepts and, you know, Jeremiah 17, I spent six months on four verses as the Lord just nurtured me in doing in this journey. I was hungry. And I went on to facilitate experiencing God groups. And in 1999, I was facilitating a group and somebody in the group said, is the Lord calling you to ministry? And I was like, absolutely not. I mean, y'all know I'm not degreed or any of those other things that I was running a plan. I had a daughter, I had a wife. All these other things. And they said, we think he is calling you to ministry. So it was in an experiencing God group that the Lord pivoted me from just being in church to having a hunger for God and for the word of God. And it was in an experiencing God group that I got the first indication that God was calling you to, me to ministry. And y'all know where that is led. When I first got here, the Lord equipped me to facilitate experiencing God with this group. But it's been more than 10 years since that was done. And when we were looking for some kind of retreat, some kind of gathering for us as a body to participate in, I did some searching and surfing on the web. It has to be the web because I can't surf on water. I don't have that kind of gravity. I found there's Experiencing God weekends and they will send in teams to lead the weekends. So I reached out to a fellow by the name of Bob Payne and without hesitation, he said, sure. And so I'd like to invite him up here today, but before I do, I would like to invite you to close both hands tight. Close your eyes and bow your heads if you will. I want you to imagine that in your hands is what occupies your time, your talent, your attention right now. 
It's the things that captivate you. It's the things that bog you down. It's the things that ensnare you because it's what you're holding on to. It's what you're pursuing after. And I encourage you in your spirit to remember the words that God promised. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. And now I pray that if you will, if you will, this is not in my words, you don't follow me, you follow Jesus. If you will, and if you want to draw near to God, that you just open your hands as a symbol of letting go of your ties and attachments to things that occupy you other than him. And let me pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name and authority of Jesus Christ because that's the only way I can come. And I'm grateful, Lord, that you've made that way. And you hear what I ask by the words of my intercessor in your ears. Lord God, as we open our hands here today, it is just an action of what we pray. You're working in our spirits to let go of the things that ensnare us, the thorn and thistle of this world, the pursuits of this world that occupy our time and attention, even within church life, Lord God. Because we can be too occupied with the things of religious exercise that we miss our Christ. So, Father, for those that have opened their hands, Lord God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you open their hearts. That we as a body can draw near to you in this time. That we can receive whatever you're going to say to us through your servant today, Lord God. And that you're going to take what we hear today and you're going to begin to work it deep down into our inner being, Lord God. To begin to mold us and transform us to be more in the likeness of Christ, Lord. And that today, you're going to soften us for what you want to mold us into going forward. So, Father, I pray by the name of Jesus, that our ears will be attentive to what you say through your servant. And Lord God, I would ask you to speak for your servants are listening. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Bob, would you come and share what the Lord's put on your heart? Folks, welcome Bob Payne. Good morning and thank you for your invitation. Uh, a few things have happened in the first 15 minutes that are the serendipities of God, and you'll hear that through my message. Uh, the pastor, nor your worship team had any idea of what I was going to speak on or preach on today, not even the scripture. But there's been some serendipities of God happening in the last 15 minutes. It really touched me. Before we begin, I do want to pray for you. Uh, I love praying scripture back to the Lord. I've spent many, many, many months in Ephesus. And... Uh, preaching at the amphitheater there, and I'd like to pray some of Paul's prayers at the church of Ephesus for you and with you this morning. Let's pray. To the saints who are at Ephesus and Bowling Green, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. For, there's, for this reason, I too, having heard of your faith at Bowling Green, your faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints in this community, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant to you in Bowling Green, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man, 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to com comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with up to all the fullness of God. Now to him, now to him who is able, now to him who is able to do far, far, far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. According to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus in Bowling Green to all the generations forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm here this morning to introduce you to a little bit about what experiencing God means. And a little over 30 years ago, the Lord touched a man named Henry Black. I mean, just an average guy that doesn't even know how to put scots on. But he walked with the Lord. And God touched him and gave him this message, and it was radical to the church at its time because the church had gotten involved in religion, process, projects, budgets, plans, and activities. And all Henry Black had been communicating from the mouth of God that we needed to run from religion and run to relationship. And it radically changed the church, and we have drifted away again. We in the church in America, and I fear especially the Baptist church, I are one, we have run back to activities and plans and committees. I can't find any of those in this book. I cannot find a three-year strategic plan. Our model is Jesus Christ, and the, the, the model of Jesus Christ, according to the Word of God, is he got up every morning, he spent time with the Father, and the Father told him what to do today. Just today. He didn't go to the Father with a list of what he wanted to do. He listened to what was on the Father's heart, and that's what he did today. And the ministry of Jesus was always the person directly in front of him. He wasn't thinking about three days later where the Father may send him. It's today. Several years ago, we had this thing going around. It was a big deal, may have been a big deal here, called What Will Jesus Do? Uh, T-shirts, wristbands, all kinds of stuff. May I suggest to you, you may even have one of those T-shirts in your closet today. What would Jesus do is the wrong question. The question is, what is Jesus doing right here today? What is God doing today in your church, in your community? What is he doing today? And experiencing God, knowing and doing the will of God is that product. And there are several realities that God led Henry Blackaby to in the Bible, and that will be our guide in about a month. Now let me just say this. I, I really am a nice guy, but I'm going to offend you right now. There's going to be a team of volunteers that are going to take three or four days out of their calendar. And they're going to drive or fly here from Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, and Maryland to serve the Lord in and through your church. Here comes the ugly part. If God is aligning all those circumstances how dare you not show up? How dare you? God is conveying serendipities for this community and this church next month. And people are volunteering their time and their money and the investment of their lives in this church. Again, I'm sorry, but how dare you not participate? But I've seen this process work at over 400 Baptist churches in America and over 100 churches around the world. Now, let me speak to that just a second. I'm going to challenge you at the end of this service. But let me ask you a question. When is the last time you prayed for this church? 
I'm not talking about going to the Lord with your list. Well, when is the last time you went to the mountaintop and listen to the heart of God for this church and this community. Jesus said, could you not keep watch with me but one hour? He didn't say, could you not come speak to me for one hour? He said, come listen to the Father's heart. When is the last time you did that? I have an incredible email list. And before I go anywhere, I send out a message to hundreds of churches around the world. And before you woke up this morning, churches in Russia, Ukraine, a hermit woman that's 92 years old that I met in 1999 in Ukraine that lives in a cave is on the team. Pray for this church this week. Every nation in Europe, their churches praying for you. In Turkey, 17 churches. I've spent a lot of time in Turkey. Pray for you. Iraq, 20 times. There are churches all over Iraq praying for you. Did you know that Iraq is our home base? Ur, Abram's home, is Baghdad. I've been to the temple. It's still there. Abram's home is still there. And so thousands of believers in Iraq are praying for you as they are in Iran, where I've been many times. Syria. There are churches in the midst of war praying for you. Nigeria by the thousands. Sudan. Congo. Zambia, South Africa, conservatively because of the seminaries I teach at in Nigeria and the churches I preach at all over Africa, conservatively, 250,000 Africans are praying for you today. I ask you again, when's the last time you prayed for your church? Early this morning, the East Coast of the United States, every state, their church is praying for you. Every province, in Canada, pray for you. Even California is praying for you. <laughs> Churches on nine islands in the Philippines praying for you. One man that I know through the internet in a place that I've never been before that I'm going to in a couple of weeks the world's largest atheistic country, one man is praying for you. Do you understand that he can lose his life today by bending his knees? Oh, Pastor, you don't know. I can't pray on Wednesday night. Will of Fortune's on. Or I can't pray on Sundays because the commanders have a game. Don't try that with me. I want to tell you about one church. When I go to Nigeria, there are two seminaries there that I'm a volunteer professor at. And then I have many, many students up in northern Nigeria. Maybe you've seen on the news the last seven or eight years a group called Boko Haram. That's the radical Muslim sect. And I have students that pastor tiny churches and villages there. So after I go teach in the seminary for six weeks, I get on a little motorcycle with a Nigerian driver and we go up in the north. And I visit. One Sunday, several years ago, I was preaching in this little thatched church, maybe 50 people. About 10 minutes into the message, an explosion hit the back door. And then another explosion. And then Boko Haram came running in, shooting people. People were dying in front of me for the cause of Christ. I'm fairly certain that's not going to happen here today. And my driver grabbed me and said, Pastor, Pastor, we must go. I said, I can't go. He said, we must. He drug me out the back door. We got on his little motorcycle and headed to the Nigerian desert. About 10 minutes out, the only thing I can carry there is a backpack. 
on that little motorcycle. And about 10 minutes out, my backpack fell off and I said, stop. He said, no, Pastor, no. We even went about 25 kilometers to the next village to bed down for the night. And I said, we must go back tomorrow for my backpack. He said, no, no. I said, I must. My Bible's there. He said, you Americans have many Bibles. I said, yes, I do, but I have a preaching Bible. So the next morning, we came back. You have to understand, when we left running, uh, we were on one of these tiny little, it's not even a motorcycle. And this guy driving me on the front is about nine pounds. And I'm a big guy now, but I was 100 pounds more than so we're going through the Nigerian desert like this. <laughs> That's why my backpack fell. We went back and we found my backpack and it exploded throughout the desert. And I found my Bible in 17 pieces. The only thing I did not find was my the back cover of my Bible. And so I have it encased in a plastic cover now. Because I never want to forget the persecuted church. And how blessed we are here in America to be able to come here and not worry about that. And when my youngest son was deployed the first time, I gave him that Bible. So don't tell me you're too busy to pray. Please. Don't tell me you're uncomfortable to pray. About 25 years ago, I went to Dr. Blackaby. I said, Dr. B, I, I'm a, I just need to talk to you about something. I'm a little uncomfortable with praying in public. And he looked at me with his soft, tender, gentle eyes and said, get over there. <laughs> we must pray. If you don't pray, this coming weekend in March will be a waste. You must, all we're asking you to do is invest your time. Jesus spells love, T-I-M-E. You must spend time with him. And so we come to experiencing God, knowing and doing the will of God. The seven realities that we'll go into great details next month, I just want to introduce them to you. Some of you have been through the study. It would be a refresher. But the first one is, Reality number one, God is always at work around you. He's always at work. It comes from John chapter 5, verse 17 and following. God, Jesus says, my father is always at work. He's at work to this very day. And we don't even notice it. God is always at work. This morning before I left my hotel, forgive me, I was reading a newspaper online. I miss newspapers. I love opening that old page. And that ain't all, but anyways... <laughs> And on uh, the newspaper I was reading, actually it was Fox News News, <clears throat> they had John chapter 5, verse 17 on there. And I wept. I wept. God is always at work. Number two, God pursues a continual love relationship with you that's real and personal. God initiates everything. He draws you to himself. There's nothing you can do to get to him. He comes to you. Christianity is the only faith in the history of mankind where God came off of his throne for sinners. Every other faith is man trying to get to God. Reality number three. This is the one after th almost 30 years I still don't understand. God invites us to join him in his work. I don't understand. He doesn't need, don't need me or you or Melvin, but he gives us the privilege to come alongside and experience him as he accomplishes his work. He invites us to join him. Route to number four. And I hear good Southern Baptists in the Bibles of fellowship halls all over this nation argue about this. Route to four says, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances in the church to reveal himself, his purposes in his ways. And I hear deacons in fellowship halls go, you know, the problem with this black is all he just believes God still speaks. And I'm here to testify to you today. I know my Redeemer lives. I heard his voice today. God speaks. Reality 5, God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. It's not a crisis. It's not a lost job. 
It's not a pass through power wheel. It's not a car wreck. It's not cancer. It's a crisis of decision. A crisis of belief that requires faith and action. Number six, you must make major adjustments in your life to join God in his work. He does not change. You must join him. And you will learn in the study that the timing of your obedience is just as important as the obedience itself. Because God will move on to someone who will be faithful in the small things. I believe God so designed the English language because he knew we Americans would be so stiff-necked that every time we were confronted with the word obedience, we would have to see right in the middle of the word obedience, the word die. Look at it. In the middle of the word obedience is the word die. God is reminding us if we're going to obey him, we must die. He says, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, obey me. Die to self. And finally, Routhie number seven, you come to know God by experience as you obey him as he accomplishes his work through you. It's very experiential. It's Hebrew. The Greeks wanted head knowledge, but the Hebrews want to experience. All throughout the Tanakh, the Old Testament, fire, rain, storm, moving mountains, talking animals, whirlwinds. It's experiential. God says to Folk in the Old Testament, it's guaranteed. It's a done deal. But brother, you've got to put your foot in the water to experience God's manifestation. Experiencing God, knowing and doing the will of God. Henry wrote this book at the age of 55. And he was encouraged at a Baptist conference by two greats, Avery Willis and T.W. Hunt, some of you may remember. They said, you got to write this thing. And he said, I don't know how to write. I've never written in my life. I've been a pastor all my life. And they said, we'll give you an editor. His name's Claude King. And that's how it came about. He's just an ordinary man. He's my Paul. He's my best friend. He's my mentor, my teacher for the last 30 years. He's in my Sunday school class. And my Paul is at the end, very near. But God is still using this study. We estimate that somewhere between 43 and 45 million people around the world have been through this work. It's available in 75 languages. When I go to Arabic countries, I go to Iran, Syria, Iraq, I take copies of Experiencing God in Arabic because it's available. And so, in a few weeks, a team of people from five states are going to come. And you have to make a decision. Am I going to die that weekend? Or is the soccer game on Saturday morning more important? In my hotel I'm staying at last night, it's this way everywhere. There must have been 40 or 50 kids in soccer uniform staying there with their parents. And it just wants to make me weep because their parents are saying soccer is more important than holy God. That's what they're saying. Oh, we'll go next week. No, no, you won't. So the team will come and we'll be here Friday night, most of the day Saturday, and through Sunday morning, introducing you sort of at like an appetizer experiencing God. So I want to share a scripture with you this morning. And then I want to try to apply a little bit of it, how experiencing God has impacted my life. You, if, if you recall in Acts, it, it, there's so much going on early in the book of Acts. And, 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 and Jesus has, has come and he, he, he died and he'd gone to heaven. And, and then there's an upper room. Wow, what a prayer meeting. I sit, shared this with your leadership team last night. Did you know the last thing that we know about Mary, the mother of Jesus, according to the book of Acts, is that she was in a prayer room. Bob Jeopardy comes on at 7.30. I don't know why God put that in the Word of God, but there's nothing in the Word of God that's accidental or incidental. He wanted us to know that Jesus' mother, the last thing she did was in, she was in a corporate prayer meeting. That's it. 
And she had just lost her son. And the day of Pentecost has come and Peter is preaching. It's incredible, his words that he's preaching. And he's rehearsing for those that will listen, really the history of the nation and all the rebellion. There's a healing of the lame beggar in chapter 3. And people are trying to give uh, Peter and John credit for this. And Peter says, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power and piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. And he goes on because they're about to put a hit on Jesus Christ. And Peter is preaching to the church. He's pre preaching to the, to the religious people of their day. May I suggest that he's preaching to us in the American church. And he says this. Therefore, Acts 3.19, Therefore, repent and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that you may have times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. You heard your pastor talk about he had to, God broke him and he knew he had to spend more T-I-M-E. Therefore, repent and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that you may have times of refreshing in the presence of God. I suggest to you, even though it's rarely preached these days in the American church, I suggest to you that repentance is the most positive word in the Bible. You know what it means. I'm simply turning from what I was doing and returning to my Holy Father. And we rare, you know what I hear a lot in the Baptist churches today? I hope you haven't mentioned this, because I'm going to be in trouble. I hear a lot about rededication. It's not in the Bible. Show me in the Bible where it says rededication. It's repentance. And if we're not regularly repenting, we're not in right relationship with Jesus Christ. We're just not. He calls us to repentance. I, I haven't even asked Melvin this, but I feel this way, and most pastors that I have deep conversations with tell me this. He would rather tell you, for you to tell him at the back of the door on Sunday, boy, I really didn't like what you said today. What you said today rubbed me the wrong way, then you say, oh, that was a wonderful message, Pastor. He needs to be using heavenly sandpaper on your heart. Let me ask you a question today. If I could, we, we go to hospitals a lot, and they do all kind of tests, and they can even put a machine on you and scan your heart. If I scanned your heart today, what would it look like? If we scan the heart of this church, this important church in this community, would it say there's some blockages? Would it say there's some, some grass that need to be rubbed away? Would it say you need an incredibly quick bypass surgery on the condition of your heart? And experience of God knowing the will of God addresses all of that. It's all centered on Ralphie number two. God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that's real and personal. So what's the condition of your heart scan today? It's a hard question. Is your heart in a condition so that God would invite you to join him in his work? Or perhaps he's convicting you today that you must repent in order that you may have times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. So I suggest to you that this weekend will be, can be, should be a time of refreshing for this church, for this people, for such a time as this. A time, the, the Bible is so clear. You need a refreshing, repent and spend time with the, with the Lord. That's it. That's it. Joshua 1 9 says a little bit different. He says something like this. He, said, he says, uh, he says, uh, 
up. Dive into the Word of God, and you will have success. Times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. So, I was a member of United Methodist Church in downtown Atlanta, small church. I was a city boy. Uh, I didn't drive when I was 23. We walked, rode a car, took a bus. I was a city boy. Little Methodist Church in downtown Atlanta because it was two blocks away. It was easy to get to. And they had a children's program. So I got introduced to them. I met my wife there. I followed her home from school there in the fifth grade. Today I would be a stalker probably. <laughs> And it wasn't a surprise when we got married there. It was just when. The question was when. And we were members there. Small little church, about 70 people. And loved it. It was, frankly, it was easy. They had really good fried chicken. <laughs> Peach cobbler, yeast rolls. I could smell a yeast roll for two miles. <laughs> and we were comfortable there. There came a time that a dear friend of ours named Trisha Reynolds invited us to First Baptist Church in Jonesville. We had known Trisha, Trisha since 6th, 7th grade. And uh, my wife says, we need to go visit First Baptist Jonesville with Trisha. And I said, no, it's not going to happen. She said, I want to go. I said, look here. First of all, it's a big church. They're like 2,000 members. And uh, people call it the Kathy Cathedral because Kathy of Chick-fil-A was a member of that. Stupid people, including me. And it's in the country. It was 35 miles away. We lived in the city. <coughs> and oh no, this is the worst. They were Baptist. And I literally said to my wife, that's a cult, right? Truth. And said, I said, I'm not going. I'm putting my foot down. I am not going. So Sunday morning, we pulled up in the parking lot at First Baptist Church. <laughs> and all these people are walking in. I'm shaking. I'm nervous. People are walking in. And most of them, Pastor, not all, but most of them were smiling. That was unusual. And about 90% of them were carrying a book. I didn't have to do that in the Baptist Church. I mean, the Methodist Church. The, that's the pastor's job. I don't have homework. That's your job. So I walked into that church kicking and screaming, and we sat down, scared of death, thousands of people. And uh, I heard the greatest preacher I ever heard a person in my life, Dr. Charles Q. Clark. And I turned to my wife and said, where has that been the last 15 years? And we started... An adventure of a little over seven years attending two churches. That'll mess you up. We go to the Baptist Church first service at eight, then run back downtown to the Methodist Church. Split personalities. And uh, we did that for a long time. My wife got involved in everything at Jonesboro Baptist, including Sunday school. And uh, she kept asking me to come. I wouldn't go. She begged me to go to Sunday school. No, I'm not going to go. I was scared to death. They'll ask me a question. I don't know the answer. That was my reason. She kept asking me, and she prayed for me. That Sunday school class, Sidney and David McKee, every week they sent me a handwritten note in the mail. Young people, that's a, you get a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> I know they don't teach writing anymore, but you write a letter, you fold it up, you put it in this thing called an envelope, you take it across the street here in this brick building that has a flag, you give them about 60 cents, whatever it is now, and they will take that stuff of where you tell them to go. <laughs> And they wrote me handwritten letters every week. When I was home, and probably when I wasn't, they would come to our home and knock on the door. Now, you've probably never done this, but I ducked and closed the blinds. <laughs> I did not want to be confronted with that Sunday school class. They called our house every Saturday. And you had to answer the phone. We didn't have caller ID. It might be granny. you got to answer it. And the Holy Spirit would use Cindy and David and McKee to confront me. And most of the time, I lied to him why I couldn't or wouldn't go to Sunday school. So my wife, again, kept asking me, begging me, pleading with me, nagging me to come to Sunday school. And I wouldn't go. 
at the first service, she would go straight down to the fellowship hall. I would turn right. I started building, you know, a built-in line. I traveled six days on business, so then I started traveling on Sunday mornings. Lie, lie, lie. After service, I had to go to the airport. Got to make a living. Got a house to pay for. We got three kids. Mel and I, and I have very similar backgrounds. And one Sunday, I was supposed to go to New York City to speak at a convention. And I don't know why. But instead of turning right, I turned left. I repented. And I went with my wife to that Sunday school class. And we walked in, 40 people stood up in spontaneous celebration because King Bob finally came to see <laughs> And they shared with me that for seven years they prayed for me every Sunday morning. That, that'll touch your heart. They were, they was, were passing out cards to everybody. He was doing it anyway, so update their records, names, address, all that kind of stuff. And anything you might want to help with in Sunday school, and they had this checkbox thing. And one of them was teach. Well, in my corporate world, every week I spoke at huge conventions and conferences all over America. So, I'm dumb sheep. I hit teach. You don't do that in a bad church. The next Sunday, I'm a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> Some of the people came from our class. And there were three men that came from that class that came with us. And my wife introduced me to them. And I knew that they knew something that I didn't know. I wanted to know. And I'm teaching Sunday school. There was one guy that was incredible. He he would share with me that uh, that he loved me and he would pray with me. We have a lot of prayer time at our church. And when I would be at the altar I'd pray, because I knew God was speaking to me, but I didn't know what he was saying. I was too ignorant. I didn't have a love relationship with him. And I would be weeping. God, what is it? And he would come beside me, put his arm around me, and pray for me. One day he invited me, he said, I want you to come to my house at 5.30 on Tuesday morning. And so I had to make a major adjustment. So I went to his house at 5.30 on Tuesday morning. He was in a coat and tie. It already consumed a pot of coffee. More than that, the glow of Jesus was all over this guy. And for two years on Tuesday mornings, he taught me the word of God. The first, I'll never forget every one of them. First scripture, John 17, 3. This is eternal life that Bob Payne may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ and Jesus. I'll never forget. Two hours every week for two years. Near the end of that time, my wife started talking about me about this thing called experiencing God. And she said, we're going to do this. I said, no, I'm not. Because you couldn't be in a Baptist church 25 years ago and not heard of experiencing God and it's got any of and she said, they'll start Wednesday night, a couple class. We're going to go. And I said, no, we're not. So we walked into the classroom on Wednesday night. <laughs> and uh, you already know who's in charge at my house. And they gave us our work with. Bunch of strangers, big church. I didn't know anybody in that class. And I'd heard that you sit in a group for 13 weeks and cry. I just didn't want to do that. <laughs> So I opened the workbook up, and inside the cover was the picture of the author, Dr. Henry Blackham. Okay, I heard about this guy. And I began to shake and weep and sweat because the author of Experiencing God was the man who'd been teaching me scripture for two years in his living. Oh. He never said my name is Dr. Henry Blackaby and I pray to the present man in Billy Graham. He just said, I love you. I want to come up inside you. And I knew I had an incredible debt to pay. People all over the world would give anything for 15 minutes of Henry Blackaby's time. And he's my best friend. I didn't know he was in Jonesboro. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm the dumbest sheep at Jonesboro. I thought he was in Canada. <laughs> and then experience of God just exploded. Then life moved on, and God was working in my life, and I started volunteering as a missionary for Black Men Ministries part-time while I was working, and something happened in 1999, and I quit my job like that on a Monday morning. And since that time, my wife... We, we haven't had a job. We volunteer.
There's many things I would love to have been able to do for my kids and my wife and my grandchildren now. But there's not a thing we need. As Pastor said, there were things we had to let go. And God fills it up. I can't tell you how I get to see them. But God is really good at details. I just tell people, mostly team members, we're God's environment. And when an airline ticket shows up, I go. If a church helps me, that's a blessing. But my responsibility is to obey him and show up. That's it. Show up with the word of God. That's it. Now, where I'm going to in a couple of weeks, I can't take my Bible with me. I can't take my ring because it has script, uh, scripture in Hebrew on it. Oh, I have to leave that home. Never had to do that before. The scripture in Hebrew, Pastor, I shared with last night, says, Could you not keep watch with me? But one hour. Pray. So life moved on, and I began to look for training. I went to every Southern Baptist seminary, and I just didn't feel comfortable. One Sunday, I was talking to Dr. B at church, and he said, Have you considered New Orleans? I said, Henry, for the last 26 years, once a month, every month, I've had to go to New Orleans on business. God is not calling me to New Orleans. Please, God, don't call me back to New Orleans. He said, there's an extension campus in Atlanta. I didn't know that. Do you guys give the cooperative program? God bless you. Because the churches like you, me and other really dumb sheep, get to go to seminary at half price. When you leave your job, that means a lot. So I visited the extension. I just fell in love with it. We have 500 students in Atlanta. We have more undergraduate students in Atlanta than we do have in New Orleans. And so I, I, I register, and I'm going to my first class in February. It's freezing outside. It's in the teens. And I'm a little anxious. I haven't been in college in 25 years. What is a footnote? How do you do that? Anyways, so I pull up. I'm a little anxious, a little nervous, and I pull up, and boy, I'm just shaking, scared to death. Old man going to school. And I see people walking in, young people, people with hair, <laughs> dark hair, skinny people, young people that don't have a clue what a 401k is. Happy go lucky, let's go to school. And I knew I cannot compete with these kids. I can't do it. And I started thinking, I've made a major mistake. I've got to call Rita and tell her, maybe I'll get my job. And I'm sitting in my car shaking, sweating, and it's freezing outside. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on my window. Hey, buddy, you okay? And I'm like, <laughs> he said, are you sure? Put my foot on the brake. Put it in reverse. Tell us to come on, I'm leaving. And then this old man said these incredibly illogical words. You know, the best I can tell, the Apostle Paul went in his first missionary journey in his 40s, and he went barefoot. I hit the electric switch and said, say what? And he repeated that. And he said, come on in, it's going to be okay. God, put the hope through the Holy Spirit, put that man right beside him. And he knew exactly what to say. If he would have said, Pastor, it's time for class, I'd have left. But he was illogical. And my first thought was, 2,000 years ago, a bunch of illogical people took a man on a roof, knocked a hole in to get into Jesus. I just experienced that in my car. My second thought was, I have a Bible. Paul didn't have that. My third thought was, I, see, I'm thinking logically, right? My third thought is, I can fly to, Delta, to uh, Ephesus on Delta. I don't have to walk. And he, he said again, it's going to be okay. And I went in, the promise of God, Dr. C. Dan Parker, he was my first professor. He loved preacher boys. He didn't care if they were 18 or 48 or 58 or 68. And I fell in love with Dan Parker. And after the first class, he called and said, I want to talk to you a minute. Okay. He said, in October, we're taking a mission trip to Ukraine. And 
with some students I'd like for you to go with. As I said, Dr. Parker, I've never been overseas. I travel all over America, but I don't have a passport. And my wife, who's very logical, is going to say, all right, big boy, you just quit your job. How are you going to pay for this? I said, well, we'll talk about it. So I went home. Sitting at our kitchen table having a family business meeting, I share this, what happened with my wife in a little bit more detail. She says, all right, big boy, you just quit your job. How are you going to pay for this? <laughs> While we're talking, I'm opening my mail, and I had a letter from a group that you may be familiar with, Focus on Family. And a friend of mine there says, we're taking a group of men to the Ukraine in October. We want you to go with us. Here at your side. I got two invitations within one hour to go to the same place as eight months. We had a brand new pastor, young pastor in a big church. Our pastor had retired. So I called Dr. Dean Hahn up. He didn't even know me. And a busy young pastor, I said, Dr. Hahn, I need to see you. Boy, he says, come on over. I'll, I'll be here. He said, before you come, I want you to talk to your wife about this and y'all pray about this. I said, yes, sir. He said, before I came here, I found out that we didn't, as a church, cooperate very well with the association. You know, we big churches. We got our own program. So we, we sent them money, but we didn't do anything. And so I had the association staff come over today and talk to our staff about association ministry. And just before they left, they said, oh, well, one more thing. In October, we're going to the Ukraine. <laughs> and he said the staff had prayed, and they all agreed that Bob Payne should represent Joshua in the Ukraine. And I said, Dr. Hunt, I don't need to come see you. And he said, why? I said, i got to go get a passport. Long story short, I wound up going with our association representing First Baptist Church of Jonesboro. When I got to the airport, I found out there were 200 people going from many, many churches. We didn't even know our team members. So I was told I was going with an experienced pastor to learn how to do mission work. Okay, 14 days with experience, good deal. So I get to the airport, the guy from the Georgia Baptist Convention finds me, he says, oh, your pastor can't come. He's had emergency in the family, now you're the pastor. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I've never preached in my life. I'm supposed to be, you're the pastor. Henry Black would be kicked in. And I said, okay. He introduced me to my team. A 76-year-old lady from another church. An 82-year-old lady from another church. An 83-year-old lady from another church. And a 78-year-old man named Henry Bedford from Tallahassee, Georgia. Henry, and I thought, we, it's going to take us forever to get even. I got all these old people in a fat boy. How in the world are we going to get anywhere? So I found out that Henry had had a rough life. He was disfigured. His face scared him. And he walked like this. He had had a couple of strokes and he had been in an automobile accident and had several surgeries. And he walked like this. Scared me to death. And they said, my job was to get Henry Bedford to Ukraine and back. So we get on the plane. I'm scared to death. These guys sit next to me. He doesn't say a word. We get off, finally after two or three connections, we're going through customs. They're tearing all the women's baggage up. They see Henry, they're scared of him. They let us go. <laughs> and after about a two and a half hour ride east to the border of Ukraine and Russia on the Dnieper River, we came to this lean-to shack with this couple that you know just really didn't have much. And, and since I was considered the pastor, they gave me and Henry their room, their bedroom. And the lady slept on the floor of the place and so forth. But Henry Bedford and I slept on a twin mattress on the floor together for 13 nights. I'm talking about spoon fed. I'm talking about we got to know each other really close the first night. But Henry had never talked. We got up early the next morning. Russians and Ukraine sleep late. We got up about 5 o'clock. We got, got dressed and Henry said, let's walk. That's the first thing he said. Let's walk. Okay. So we're going through the Russian woods. He's like a Marine on a force march, and I'm dying. I found out he had a pedometer. He had to walk six miles a day. So we walked three miles around. At the three mile point, we're at this huge granite stone, huge, maybe close to the size of this room. It was three mile marker. And he said, Are you going to read the Bible, or I have to slap it? This is guys. So I had a pocket New Testament. I ran out of First Peter, and then he climbed the rock. I don't know how. He climbed the rock and he lifted his hands to the sky, and he sang, "How great thou art." That's 
He sang it like I'd never heard before or since. He came out off the rock. He said, your turn. He said, Henry, I don't sing. I'm learning to pray. I hope I learn how to preach someday. He said, your turn. So the Lord's teaching me to follow old man. No offense, sir. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had some fun. Anyway. So somehow I negotiated that rock. I'm up that rock. And Henry lifted his hand, so that's what I did. And the only song I could remember was a praise chorus that our music minister was teaching us. It's the only thing that came to my mind. Now, I'm not a singer, but I'm going to try to remember and sing that chorus to you. So I lifted my hands and I sang, Lord, I magnify with hands lifted high. I offer up this sacrifice of praise. Lord, I seek your face in this holy place. Create in me a clean heart. Let my tongue proclaim your precious name. You alone deserve my sacrifice of praise. And Henry said, let's walk. So every morning we did that. About the third morning, we noticed eyes in the woods. And after several mornings, we had our translator go with us and go to the woods and find out what, it, what, what do they want. And after what seemed like an hour of arguing, he brought 37 Russians who had been told for 200 years in their family by the Russian government and the Ukraine government that there is no God. God is dead. So they came, don't miss this, they came to the rock. And so we asked him through the, through the translator, what does they want? And then he said these exact words, translating, they want to know why this ugly old man and this fat boy climbed the rock every morning. <laughs> that morning I preached my first gospel message. And 37 people who had been told that we just know God surrendered their hearts to Jesus at the rock. And they demanded to be baptized. And we explained to them that you were saved. It doesn't really No, we want to do it. So we got some help and we got some pulleys and some ropes over some trees into a very cold Dnieper River. And I went in there and I baptized the first 37 people I've ever baptized in my life. And I said, thank you, God. You see, God is always at work. God pursues a continual love relationship with you that's really personal. God invites us to join him in his work and God speaks by the Holy Spirit. And he brings us to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. And we must make major adjustments to join him. And we come to know him by experience. And I thank God for a nagging, praying wife. I thank God for a faithful, faithful Sunday school class. I thank God for Trisha Reynolds who invited us to Joe's birth. I thank God for an old man named Dan Parker who knocked on my window. I thank God for Henry Blackaby. I thank God for my church. I thank God for a lady you don't even know. You'll hear about in about a month named Terry Mitchell who started all of this stuff. Because God is always at work. Three years later, I was driving from Atlanta to uh, Raleigh from a meeting with a pastor and it's about an eight-hour drive, and I got there, and the pastor's secretary said, he can't see you today. He's busy. I went, wait a minute. I just drove from Atlanta. He can't see you. So I left kicking and screaming. You probably don't do this. I was arguing God. God, don't you know how busy I am? God, do you realize how expensive this gas is? Such an idiot. Such an idiot. I'm driving south on 85. I'm just going to go back home. I'm not going to get a hotel. Around Greensboro, my phone, my phone rang. Unidentified. I never answered those, but for some reason, I answered it. This guy says, "Is this Bob Payne?" Yes. I've been looking for you for a week. I got your number from First Baptist Johnsburg. Okay. He said, "I don't know what happened three years ago here, but I'm in the Razishev region of Ukraine." 
I pulled over to the side of the interstate 85. He said, there's 200 people in this church today. And they have something to say to you. And I'm going to hold my phone. So I'm sitting along I-85, arguing with God. And I hear 200 Ukraine voices saying, Lord, I magnify. God is always in the world. Recently, I've been back to Ukraine. I don't have time to tell you that, but maybe you learn a week in. Do I have a few more minutes? Oh, I love Church of that Clock. I just want to tell you a couple more things. <laughs> you brought your wife with you today, Frank. Um, sometimes times of refreshing are difficult. 2004, 2005, I found myself in a place that was not on my calendar. It was called pancreatic cancer. It was the worst two years of my life. But it was the best two years. You don't survive that. That was my first of three terminal illnesses. And we experience God's love. We lost everything. But we gained everything. It was so difficult to watch my children watch their father die. But the lessons they learned, they still talk about it. As a psalmist says, I thank God for my pain. I thank God. It's never about the cancer. It's never about the heart attack. It's never, dare I say, COVID. I've had it twice. It's always about the sovereignty of God and the activity of God in your life. It's always about God. He's sovereign over everything. If He's not sovereign over 100%, He's not sovereign over that. He's sovereign over everything. I wish I had time. I'll just tell you one thing. I was dying and I was able to come home for Christmas for three days. And my daughter, the only thing I ever asked God during the time was, if it be your will, our daughter is pregnant, please let me live long enough to hold that baby. And Jonathan was born in the same hospital I was in. But I never could touch him because of all the incisions and the hoses and the tubes, and the pain. And so I came home Christmas Eve, and I couldn't sleep in a bed. I had to sleep in a recliner because I couldn't lay down with all the stuff. And uh, so the kids were all home, and April and Bert, our son-in-law, brought Jonathan. He was six months old, and he wouldn't go to sleep. They said he'd always been a good baby when I sleep. He was crying, wouldn't go to bed. I said, "Give him to me." I'd never be able to hold him. My daughter says, Daddy, you can't hold him. And I said, please. She said, no, Daddy, you'll spill him. I'll never forget my daughter spilling him. <laughs> and I begged my wife, please let me hold my grandson. And finally, Rita gave me John. Thank you, God. The promises of It felt so good. And so I said, you guys go to bed. I'll keep them through the night. My wife, I had a central line, and she gave me all my meds, including morphine at night. I said, no meds, no morphine. And I fought with my daughter, and they finally let me have Jonathan through the night in the recliner. It was first Christmas Eve. And I was talking to him. I figured the only way I can stay awake is to talk. And I told them about the goodness of God, the greatness of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the inerrancy of the Word, the incredible church of God, the body of Christ. Talking him about deep theological principles. This six-month-old little baby boy. And I kept telling him, your papa loves you with an everlasting love. There's nothing you can do to separate your papa from you. I've always loved you. I remember telling him, 
Now, one day you may be running through your grandmother's craft room and knock her sewing machine over. Your, your grandmother's going to be upset, but your papa will love you with everlasting love. I remember telling him one time, I'll, even if you eat my last Oreo cookie, I still love you. <laughs> At 3 30, 3 in the morning, talking to Jonathan. It came to my mind of Jesus at Gethsemane, praying to the point of death. He asked his three closest friends to keep watch with him through the night. He came back and they were asleep during the prayer meeting. And he said to them, to his three closest friends, could you not? Keep watch with me. But one. And my grandson initiated that ministry that I'm involved with. Every email that I send, those words on the bottom of it. It's what's on this ring. That little baby boy. In August, I'll take him to college. Baptist college. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but I'll just say very quickly, in uh, uh, 2009, August 2009, there was something going around the world called the H1N1 virus bird flu. Three people in Atlanta got it. I was in ICU, lost a young. That was my second. But it doesn't matter because God's always at work. God's always pursuing a continuing love relationship with you that's real and personal. So he's invited you to be here next month. I say again, how dare you? How dare you not participate? We're going to have a different invitation this morning, okay? We don't need any music. Is that okay? Okay? Oh, is that okay? Okay. <laughs> The walls won't fall down. It'll be okay. Anyways. And I want to tell you a story before we do that. Is a, this is a 30-minute thing. I'm going to try to do it in two or three minutes. Claude King and I, mostly Claude, did some research several years ago. And you can watch him on a video do this. He's a little bit much better than me. From the point of on the word consecrate. And many times, especially in the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, we're... We see the word consecrate. And it usually means separate yourself, cleanse yourself, prepare for what God has and so forth. But there's seven times in the Old Testament we mean something different. It means surrender your all to holy God. That's a Bob Payne variation, but that's what it means. Seven times. And we started doing research. And back in medieval times, once a year, the serfs, the servants, the slaves would present themselves up on the platform with the king and all his adornment in his big chair. And they would come before the king once a year and he would hold his hand open. And they would come forward and put their folded hands in his hands and he would fold his hands over theirs. And they were saying that what that was committing is, my king, I'm your man. Everything that I have, my family, everything I own is in your hands. And I commit myself this year to my king. And the believers of the time started noticing that. And that's where we get our position of prayer. It's, this is not in the Bible. It, it's not wrong or something. But our kneeling and putting our hands together came out of any of the times. The Hebrews stood up with their hands up with their eyes open and prayed. And that's okay. Guess it, get this. Jesus said, watch and pray. He never said close your eyes. It's a man-made thing. So we're going to do something a little different here. And in a moment, I'm going to have your pastor come right here. And Melvin, I want you to hold your hands up. And I want to challenge this church family. 
If you're on board with your pastor and you would say today, I'm in. I will participate in the weekend. I will do the study as you direct. I mean, I recognize that this is the next act of obedience for my church family. I mean, so I'm going to ask each one of you to come here and put your hand in Melvin to let him simply close his hand around you to bless you and go on. Everybody got that? Now, there's some of you who won't do that. And I'll be praying for you because this is God's time for this day. I wasn't going to do that, but you mentioned some things that you talked about holding your hands tight and letting them go. And I thought, that's the ceremony. Don't normally do this. There's a lot more to it, but that's the basic principle. So, in a minute, I'm going to have Melvin come up here. And it's going to be your time. There's not going to be any music, but I do want to give you some encouragement that this is the right thing to do. You know it is. We're stubborn and stiff-necked, but you know this is the appropriate and proper thing to do. Are you familiar with the group Casting Crowns? They live in our area. I sometimes teach Mark Hall's lyrics. They are biblical. And a few years ago, he put out a new song. They put out a new song that he put to a new tune. And kids love it. Teenagers love that even some of those old folks like it. And the, and the kids didn't know that old Mark Hall had zapped them with a 130-year-old Presbyterian hymn. And the lyrics to the chorus testify that Jesus is worthy. And therefore, you should come forward to your pastor this morning and dedicate your life to your next act of obedience, and possibly you may want to go pray. But the uh, I told you know that I'm not a singer, but that chorus went something like this: Living, He loved me; dying, He saved me; buried, He carried my sins far away; rising, He justified freely forever. One day, He's coming. Oh, glorious day. Oh, glorious day. Glorious day. Pastor, here, please. This is your time, church. We're not going to have any music. This is your time, not me. Come on. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Mary, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. And one day he's coming for oh, a glorious day. Oh, glorious day. Glorious day.